Well, growing up, uh, we had access to fireworks all year round. We didn't have to wait till no 4th of July, till no New Year's Eve or anything like that. In fact, we would just make our own fireworks like out of black gunpowder and a steel tube and then a fuse we made out of a shoelace or something like that. And we would just light it and run as fast as we can, hide behind a piece of plexiglass so we could still see it as an absolute crater was just blown into the earth. We were redneck status, y'all don't even know. But if you're familiar with fireworks, you know the ones called artillery shells that go up into the sky and explode in this colorful, you know, burst of fire. Those are so fun to look at and they're so pretty, aren't they? Well, as kids, we would light them on the ground, not in the tube that shot them up, but on the ground. And my brothers and I and some friends would um, see who could stand the closest to it. It was like our game. And we would be like, as it exploded and you found yourself in like a snow globe of fire. Sometimes it would hit you like a piece of magma or something. We're like, ah, it's burning holes in my clothes. It's like, no, oh, there's no hair on my leg anymore. We thought it was great. It's crazy. And I remember telling people about this and they would look at me like I was absolutely dumb. Like some of y'all might be thinking right now. And they were thinking, don't do stuff like that. Especially as I told adults. They would say, you can die doing something like that, which I don't think is true. Like, you might could get hurt, which thankfully none of us ever did. But it did get me thinking, like, death is real. And in fact, death is the last part of life. It's inevitable, and it's a guarantee for all living things that that life will come to an end. I don't really quote Kanye West very often, but you know it's a good sermon whenever I'm about to, because he said nothing in life is promised except death. I don't agree with everything Kanye says, but that right there, I can't argue with. He right. And then there's someone else who's on a similar plane of mental capacity named Benjamin Franklin, who we might be familiar with. Some of us back in school, like, oh my gosh, history. But Benjamin Franklin said, in this world, nothing can be said for certain except death and taxes. I'm an adult. I don't know much about taxes. I probably should. But he said it too. This is a something that is for certain. And I'm not trying to be a downer tonight talking about death and everything because everybody just got a little bit more depressed probably as soon as I said that word and we realized that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. But it is because it's something that we all have to consider. Thinking about death should impact our life. And whether you're a believer or a non-believer, or whether you're just testing the waters of Christianity, wherever you might be, we all have this in common, this life that will come to an end, and we all have to consider what happens after, right? So don't tune out tonight. I'm not going to give you all the answers tonight, mainly because I don't know all the answers, and secondly, because we don't want to be here all night, right? But I do just want to ask the question that we asked at the beginning. Are you ready? And it's really, are you ready to die? Like, if your life ended, would you be confident in knowing what happens after that enough to have peace with the fact that your life and your time here on earth just came to an end? Right? With 100% certainty. Because in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says this to his disciples, his followers, and his closest friends. John records Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus, the one who lived and died on the cross for the payment of your sins so you could avoid the punishment of hell and rather live eternally in heaven if you believe in him. This is Jesus. And he said, I am the way. I am the truth. Not a way, not a truth. The way, the truth, and the life. Life. Don't focus on death as much. Focus on life tonight. No one comes to the Father except through me, says Jesus. I'm the only way. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then John, he's talking about Jesus. Later in 1 John 2.25, he says, This is what Jesus promised us. Eternal life. Eternal life. By grace, through faith. Meaning, Jesus, by his grace, gives us what we don't deserve. Which is eternal life. And all we have got to do is put our faith in him in order to get it. We don't have to do anything, right? You don't have to earn it. You can't. The only one who can earn God's love is God himself. That's why Jesus earned it for you on the cross, because you couldn't. He took your place. And this is Jesus. He's like, just believe in that. That's all you've got to do. 
Let the life change happen after. Some of us think, I'm not good enough to go to church. I'm not a good enough person yet. You don't have to be because there was already a good enough person for you. His name was Jesus. You've got to hear this tonight. Your post-life impacts your present life. I'm going to say it again. Listen, post-life impacts your present life. It's not the other way around. People think that our present life, how we live, the things that we say, the things that we do, if we're good enough, then it will earn us a spot in heaven in that post-life, what happens after. But that's not the case. The truth, the reality, the hope, the promise, the guarantee of heaven should impact the way that we live today because we're living for heaven. We have the hope of eternity. We have the assurance of salvation in Jesus. That should change our lives. That should change what we do, right? It should change how we speak. What we know about what happens after death should impact our life, right? Let's check out this example. This is where we're going to be tonight. It's in Luke chapter 16. I love this scripture a lot. Uh, I don't know what it's called in your Bible. There's like a section. It's a bold header. Luke chapter 16, right over verses 19 through 31. If you've got your Bible, if you're online, like pop open another tab or whatever. But get into the scriptures, y'all. This is part of it. Luke 16, in my Bible it says, the rich man and Lazarus. Now, I know a Lazarus in the Bible. He's the one who Jesus resurrected. He died, and everyone was like, Jesus, your friend Lazarus died! And he was like, I know, let's give it a few days. And they're like, what? And Jesus is chilling, like, towns over, and four days later he comes to this stanky tomb, and then everyone's like, oh, don't open it, don't open it! It's like some bad leftovers in your fridge that your mom asks you to take out, and you don't want to, because it's going to be just putrid when you pop that seal. Pop. What? Why is there jelly? But there wasn't jelly, it was this man, Lazarus. Jesus was like, Lazarus, come out! Lazarus just came, you know, Tusi sliding out of that tomb, which is pretty cool. So, uh, but it's not that Lazarus we're talking about tonight. I guess Lazarus was a common name, kind of like Karen, but if your name was Lazarus, like good things were associated with it. So that's kind of different. So uh, there's a guy, Lazarus, and he's with a rich man, and here we'll pick it up in verse 19. There was a rich man, says Jesus. He's telling us a parable, and a parable is a story with a purpose. Probably wasn't necessarily true, didn't really happen, but it had a point, okay? So it's a parable. Jesus says there's a rich man. He's dressed in purple, the color of luxury, status, wealth, prosperity. He was high up. He said he was dressed in purple and fine linen. Fine linen would be like your undergarments. They were super soft, super smooth, really high class, really nice undies. I don't know why Jesus thought it was appropriate or like important to include that. I guess like you, you didn't even, maybe you didn't even have undies, like if you were a little lower class, you know what I'm saying? But this guy, he had purple, he had the nicest undies, right? And he lived in luxury every single day, so this is the guy. Verse 20, at his gate, he had a gate, made for keeping people out. Somehow this guy, Lazarus, a beggar, had gotten in. Lazarus was covered with sores. He was kind of like the bad leftovers. Verse 21, longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. He just wanted the scraps. Even the dogs, they came and they licked his sores. This man was down there with the dogs, as far as social status goes. So in this parable, Jesus is setting the scene, and there are two characters. The first lived in what is advertised as the goal of life, what we should aspire to, what we see in all of the YouTube ads and the Instagram ads, and we see a person, and they're just chiseled, and they're beautiful, and their teeth are perfect, and they have a perfect family, and it's like, this is what you should aspire to be like. That was the rich man. The nicest undies! How? That was the rich man. Then you have this other guy, Lazarus. You're not going to see him in a commercial. You're not going to see him uh, in an ad because he's not what we're going for in life as far as what he looked like at all. Right? And I wonder how many of us feel like Lazarus. Where we're just not, we're not that. We're not what we want to be. We're not what, we're, what society says we should be. We're not accomplishing what we should. We're not as smart as that person. We definitely don't look as pretty as her. We're not athletic. We're not as talented. We're not as funny. We don't have as many friends or followers. We feel forgotten. We feel excluded. We feel less than. We might feel ugly so, po- so far to the point where we're feeling depressed. 
We might feel like taking a step further and, and causing pain to ourselves because we feel like we deserve it. But that's not true. We might get made fun of online or to our face. These are lies, by the way. And if that's you, if you felt that way, I have, I still do sometimes. And if that's you, recognize this. Listen, Jesus named the poor man. He said there's a rich man. His name we don't even know. He's not important. It doesn't matter because his name isn't what's going to go down in history. The fact that he was caught up in his wealth and his possessions and what he had is going to go down in history. But Lazarus was the name of the poor man. Jesus said his name. Jesus knows your name, too. I'm encouraged by that. He says the rich man, but Lazarus. So if you feel rejected, Jesus knows your name. He sees you. He sees you. And that matters. In the very next verse, Lazarus dies, which is heavy, I know. You're like, dang, I thought you said this wasn't going to be a downer. Hold on, because eventually the rich man dies too. It's not something to celebrate, you know, it's not something to celebrate, but they both die, and here's the point of the parable. You can read the rest of it on your own, we're not going to do it tonight, but what basically happens is this, Lazarus, the poor man, he goes to heaven, and then the rich guy, whose name we still don't know, doesn't. Then Jesus describes this interaction where the rich guy is now begging. The rich guy is now begging after his life ended, and he's in eternity. Is he experiencing eternal life? Is he experiencing paradise and perfect fellowship with Jesus? No, he's not. He's in a different place, and he's begging to get out, but it's too late because the decisions that he did or didn't make on earth as far as putting his faith and trust in God are eternal. The impact, the implications are eternal, which is pretty hardcore. You know, when I was about 10, my dad, I mean, I, I grew up on a motorcycle. My dad would just put me on the front or the back of a motorcycle. I'd fall asleep as he drove that thing cross country for hours and hours on end. I'd wake up, have a snack, go back to sleep, wake up, gnarly sunburn. I just love being on a motorcycle. There's something calming and peaceful about it to me. One of my dad's friends came over to our house one time. He just bought an unnecessarily powerful motorcycle, like one of those rocket ships on two wheels. That's like, why would anyone own this? I'm going 100 miles per hour and I'm in first gear. That's so dumb. But nevertheless, he brings it over. My dad looks at me and he's like, hey, you want to go for a spin on this thing with me? I said, yeah, I love riding motorcycles. He said, go get a helmet. I raced dirt bikes at the time, so I got my dirt bike helmet. Now, if you know the difference between a street bike helmet, which is smooth for aerodynamicy, and a dirt bike helmet, which ain't smooth, it's got an open face, big mouth guard on it to prevent rocks from hitting you in the teeth when someone's kicking up, we call it roost, right in front of you, and then it has a visor on the top. You see this? A visor on the top. Once again, people are slinging rocks, you can put your head down, it doesn't hit you in the face. It's great. You're never going to be going that fast on a dirt bike, so it doesn't need to be smooth, right? Two different things, designed for two different purposes. But anyway, that's the helmet that I had, so I grabbed it. We start going on this ride, and we find our, it's fine, I'm on the back, I'm hanging on my dad like this, you know what I'm saying? And we stop before this long stretch of wide open road, just straight, as far as you can see. And my dad looks back at me, and he's like, you want to see what this thing will do? So I'm 10, and I'm like, uh, yes, <laughs> of course. Who says no to that? So he's like, hold on. I did, okay? And uh, he starts just clicking through the gears, and this thing sounds unreal. It's like, me, 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 me. And we are just zipping. And uh, I remember thinking, like, we're definitely going over 100 miles per hour, probably closer to two, but I want to see how fast we're going. And man, if curiosity didn't kill the cat, I peek over my dad's shoulder to look at the speedometer on the motorcycle. And as soon as I could see that we were in fact nearing 200 miles per hour, the wind caught my visor. And a motorcycle helmet has a strap underneath the chin to keep it on your head, which is a good thing, normally. Not in this case. Because when the wind caught the visor, it pulled my head back almost 200 mile per hour wind yanking me by the neck off the back of the motorcycle 
at the last second, I grab onto my dad by the shirt. And uh, it's kind of like in a movie where the person's hanging onto a cliff and one hand falls off. And they're like, ah! It was like that. And with the hand that had fallen off, I start punching my dad as hard as I can because I'm screaming at the top of my lungs, but he can't hear me because the wind is so loud and his face is in a nice, smooth helmet! Mine wasn't, so I'm punching him as hard as I can, but he thinks I'm on the back just having a great time. And he's like, oh, this guy's loving it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's not what was going on. Oh, faster? Okay. I'm like, no! Getting sucked off the back of this thing. I felt like my life was flashing before my eyes. I was going to die. And at the very last second, whenever I couldn't hang on any longer, the road came to an end. We stopped. I grabbed back onto my dad. And I was weeping, screaming, crying. He was like, was that awesome or what? And he realized something was horribly wrong. And I told him, I wasn't having a good time. I thought I was really about to die. And if I did that day, then that would have been the end for me. That would have been it. That would have been the end for, of Rin Harpole, right? Thankfully it wasn't. But if it is over for me, it's not over for Jesus. Jesus lives because I have influence. And the people whose lives I touched, even if I love riding motorcycles, even still to this day, and if I die on one, I trust that Jesus will live on he, because I have left a legacy. That's why we call it legacy student ministry, right? Because if your life ends, man, Jesus' ministry don't stop. If you've lived your life for him, I have influence and so do you. Be encouraged by that and be establishing that legacy every single day. In verse 27 of the passage that we're in, Jesus describes this rich guy and he's begging, remember? And he says, I beg you, Father. He's like talking to God. I beg you, Father, send Lazarus, who's in heaven. He's like an angel now or something. He's like, send him back to earth to my family. I have these brothers who are still alive. I have five brothers. He's like, let Lazarus warn them so that they also will not come to this place of torment. He doesn't want his friends and his family to experience for eternity what he has. He's like, yes, I have, but I want this for them. Spare them. Send Lazarus. Send an angel. Send somebody. Look how the roles have reversed. Now the man who was rich on earth wants the poor man to save him. It's backwards. But what's God's response? He says, your brothers have Moses and they have the prophets. It's kind of like, look, they have the Bible app. They have pastors. They have churches. And for those of us who have friends who are not saved, God's sitting there saying, like, I have provided all of these options for them. Let them listen to them. And this is us. It's our responsibility to share the gospel. This is the Great Commission. It's great because it came from Jesus. It's a commission because he commissioned us to go and make disciples of all people baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all I have commanded you. And he says, I am with you. I'm with you. You're not alone. I'm doing this with you, which is important because all we can do is present the gospel, but Jesus does the saving. God does the saving. The Holy Spirit does the saving. But the rich guy who's in this place of torment is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They have the Bible app. They have churches. They have youth groups. They have, you know, people telling him about God and stuff, but it's not enough. He's like, if someone comes back from the dead, like they know Lazarus died, if he comes back and visits them, then they'll repent. They'll feel remorse for their sin. They'll put their faith in you, God. They'll repent for sure. Really? The answer back was, look, from God, if, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they're not going to be convinced even if someone raises from the dead. You know, there was a person who raised from the dead who convinced me. His name is Jesus Christ. He was dead. He was put in the ground for three days. Hundreds of witnesses saw this event happen, and then hundreds of witnesses saw him walk out of that grave and say what's up to a bunch of people before ascending into heaven, saying, this is legit. This is real. I am the Son of God. Believe in me. I can't argue with that. It, it's a fact. It happened. It's been recorded by hundreds that have been passed down through thousands of years. It's the truth. It's real. There's, there's no doubt. There's no question in my mind. There's no question. But it's not going to be enough for some people. Even that isn't going to convince some people. And I'm a completely different person today 
than I would have been if I never put my faith in Jesus. My family looks different than I ever thought it would have. I was going for more of the rich man, right? But my life is rich now in a different way, and it's a better way. And I'm 100% certain that when I die, I'm going to be with Jesus Christ in heaven. He paved the way for me. He said, come on, I'm preparing a place for you. I'm waiting here for, I'm waiting here for you. Whenever it's your time, you're going to be with me. I'm like, cool, let's go. And so is the rest of my family. Are you? I'm ready. Are you? Are you ready? Are you ready? I'm not saying your life has to look like mine. I'm not saying your life has to look like Lazarus's. It doesn't have to, and it can't not look like the rich man. What really matters is, have you put your faith in Jesus? Have you put your faith in Jesus? That's where we're at tonight. That's the difference maker. That's what it all comes down to. Do that first. Make 100% sure you've put your faith in Jesus first. If you're rich or you're poor, it doesn't determine your eternal destination. But know this, your destination is eternal. It's forever. Like we call it that for a reason. For the rich man, it was too late. Don't let it be too late for you. Don't let it be. Don't die and wonder. Don't die and have regret and, and be like, dang, I should have done it. It wasn't a game. It wasn't, it wasn't this hoax. It wasn't a theory. It's legit. And it's legit for your friends and your family, too. And that should, that should burden us. I should burden us because we have a choice. Yes, I hope you've made that choice. I pray all the time that you have made that choice. But I hope that you hope your friends and your family be making that choice too. And we've got a responsibility with that. Believers, Christians, listening to this, watching this, you might be doing a great job being the light of the world for Jesus. And I applaud you. Thank you so much for that. Well done. Keep it up. Don't stop. Some of us who are Christians or believers, we need to stop being just a believer and start actually being a Christ follower. Don't just be a Christian and enough to get by and get into heaven. Be a Christ follower. Let your life actually look like him and draw people to him. That's what light does. Don't be hiding your light under a bowl. Let it shine for the world to see. People will be attracted to not you, but Christ in you. And that matters. We can make a difference on this world. Some of us, we might have unsaved friends, and we need to have a conversation with them, but we don't know how. We're like, I got a friend, they're an atheist. I got a friend, they don't believe in Jesus. They had a bad experience with the church. Their family, they don't go to church, they won't do it, they're against it. Whatever the case might be. We need to have a conversation with that friend, and we don't know how. I got to say, you've got me, you've got amazing small group leaders who want to help you, guide you, give you some tools and some resources to have that conversation well. Reach out to us. We're here to help you. We love you. We love the world, like, in your generation. Guys, there's a, a dead and dying world around us all every day. And we can make a difference. Do you realize this? Some of you are watching this maybe and you don't know Jesus. You've never prayed that prayer. You've never put your faith in him. I don't want you to go another day not being certain. If you're not 100%, like, be tonight where you can answer the question with 100% certainty, with absolute assuredness that you are going to go to heaven to spend the rest of eternity with Jesus after this life here on earth. I'm just going to pray for us and uh, let God do what he does. So, God, thanks for tonight. Thanks for your son becoming sin for us, dying for us in our place. So all we've got to do is believe in him, but it doesn't stop there. That's where it starts. Eternity starts in that moment, and that's when we can start living for you. We want to bring as many people as we possibly can with us when we get to walk through the gates of heaven. So God, if someone's watching this right now, I pray that they pray this along with me, and believers... I pray that we're praying this right now too. Like, let's just pray it all together over our non-believing friends. If you're not a Christian, then God, I pray that they pray this prayer right now for the first time. God, I believe in you. I believe that you hear this prayer. I believe that you created me and everything, that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to live the perfect life, to die on the cross for my sin, and that he rose again three days later. I want to put my faith in him and I want to be a Christian right now in this moment. 
I want to follow you. Lord, I know I'm a sinner, I'm messed up, and I don't deserve it. But you offer it to me anyway. Thank you for that. May I be different from this moment forward. And it's in Jesus' name we all pray. Amen.